Hello, you are listening to The Local Lens, the podcast from the Powell County Health Department in Kentucky, Rio, where we go inside our community's experience with the drug epidemic. Our show is coming to you from Stanton, Kentucky, down at the foothills of Appalachia. And our show is all about looking for as many different perspectives on the drug epidemic as we can find. And today on this episode, we have an incredible perspective for you guys. Our guest this week does many things, but perhaps most notably, he has been a doctor for decades. Uh, He's been a really well-respected doctor, a highly effective one. But then up and out of nowhere, he ran for Senate in the state. He's now a senator for Kentucky. So through him, we have a guy who understands the healthcare system, who is helping with healthcare policy in the state. And that's very important because he is an advocate for recovery. So he is able to kind of help our policy be supportive of recovery. It is easy to forget how big of a role this plays. So anyways, buckle in, you're in for a good interview. You're listening to The Local Lens. I'm your host, Nate Brooks. These are our people using our voices, telling our stories, because no one sees it like we do. My name is Ralph Alvarado. I um, do internal medicine and pediatrics. I'm a, a practicing physician here in the state of Kentucky. We um, have been practicing now for 20, I think 25 years, believe it or not. Uh, also serve in the Kentucky State Senate in the 28th District, which includes Clark, Montgomery, Northern Fayette counties. Um, and I've been serving in that role now for seven years. So got elected in 2014 and I just finished my seventh uh, session of the General Assembly. And it goes by pretty quick. It's amazing how fast it goes. But um, I'm also serving as a director for Isaiah House, um, which um, is, is kind of a recovery center, really, in Willisburg and has now a lot of uh, outlying clinics uh, to help people going through substance use treatments. And um, proud to, that's a new role for me, so I'm proud to serve in that. And I also do a lot of long-term care, a lot of nursing home work, uh, and um, was a primary care doctor for a long time, but kind of evolved into long-term care, which is served, it's a lot more flexible schedule for me, which serves a purpose when I'm serving in the General Assembly. So. And he initially came to Kentucky looking for a school program looked at internal medicine pediatrics combined programs there weren't very many back in the mid 90s early 90s and so when i applied for residency in 90 it was 94 is when i started my residency um there were a lot of uh there were only very few programs really west of uh, the mississippi most of them were in the center part of the country and east and so i you know i found different spots uk had a good reputation um I uh, came to interview at UK, UofL, interviewed up in Michigan, Florida, um, different parts of the country. And when all was said, when all was said and done, I liked Kentucky the best. And um, my wife and I were engaged. I said, hey, I like Kentucky. We don't know anybody there. She said, I go, well, we got to start our roots somewhere. Yeah. And once we got here and started here, um, fell in love really with Kentucky and the people here and got Kentuckified is what I tell most people. <laughs> and, um, you know, we were from California originally. I, I didn't really want to go back. And so we... Um, once residency was completed, we had opportunities to start our own practice, and we started one in Winchester and built a big practice. We're the biggest ones in town for the longest time. I think we still are, maybe, the, the practice that I left behind anyways. And, um, you know, it's home for us now. So our kids are born and raised here, and this is, this is home. And n- never thought I'd serve in the General Assembly, but here I am. So yeah, yeah, there you go. There you go. And it's interesting because most people grow up and leave Kentucky. <laughs> it's not a lot of people dream of getting to California someday, but you've flip that. Thank you for doing that. No, no, I'll tell you, it's a a great state. I tell people this is a state that's so unique. Um, And I I was just talking to my daughter who's going to school in Alabama right now. So we're talking about Kentucky being a place where you mix uh, Rust Belt work ethic, Midwestern sensibility, Southern hospitality, all in one spot. No other state can claim all those three things. We got all of that here. But what's more important than that is this. There's more trust in fellow man here than there is in other parts of the country. And um, so I, I like it about Kentucky. And once people get to know you here, they'll give you the shirt off your back, you know, off their back, rather. They'll, they'll do anything yeah. for you once they gain trust. And that's the thing you don't find in a lot of parts of the country. So um, I, we love it here. This is home, and, and uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call home any other place. Yeah, yeah. good. So um, a couple questions about just introductions. The first one, um, what was your introduction into uh, really the drug crisis that we have here? When, when did you first start taking note that that was going on? In- well, I mean, I think really we, you know, I, I go back to when I was practicing in, in a clinic setting. I mean, I was part of a lot of those practices where you had the drug manufacturers coming to us talking about, um, 
you know, pain being the sixth vital sign and uh, people are in pain and we're going to, you know, insurance companies saying if you're not controlling people's pain, you may get paid less. And a lot of these different incentives, hospitals were that way. They were getting graded on quality measures based on the level of pain of their patients. And a lot of drug companies coming, I remember those pitches where they would come in and say, hey, this is not addictive, it's long acting, mm -hmm. it's not tamper resistant, these different things. It was like early 2000s? Yeah, it was, yeah, early 2000s. Okay. Um, that was about right. Because I started my practice in 98, so probably between, probably around 2000, somewhere to maybe 2007, 8, you started hearing people going awry. And we, we would see patients coming into the office who you could tell had problems. We started drug testing people, um, and we were worried about certain folks getting short acting and you know, if we're going to put them on anything long-acting stuff, we would drug test them. We were doing the right things. But when the General Assembly, uh, this is before my time in office, in 2011 called a special session to pass a bill called House Bill 1, which was a bill that was going to um, basically criminalize the practice of prescribing narcotics to patients if you didn't do a 114-point checklist. And when we started, that's when we started paying attention as providers saying, wait a second, I got a, you know, I've got a kid on an ADHD med who's seven years old who went from Fs in school to As in school because he can focus, and I've got to do a 114-point checklist every visit, or, or I get a Class A misdemeanor, six months in prison and suspension or loss of my license plus a monetary fine. Yeah, no thanks, I don't want to do that. And it, and it did, it had that effect. I mean, a lot of doctors no longer write any narcotics. I was one of those. When that bill passed, it was passed without a lot of input from the medical profession, had a lot of negative consequences, um, and I stopped writing stuff altogether. And, and they amended it so that we could write stuff in the hospital and in nursing homes and that kind of setting without as much scrutiny. Um, but still, you had a, if you had any outpatient prescriptions. And so that's when I started paying a lot more attention because they got the attention of the General Assembly, the Medical Association in the state, and our Board of Medical Licensure. And they started going after doctors, you know, and I started paying more attention. Good, good physicians. Some, some were pill mill doctors who were bad guys and needed to be put away. There were some guys who were legit, who were probably too liberal in writing narcotics. Those things would find their ways into the bad people's hands. But those doctors were being clamped down on. And so you started as a doctor paying closer attention. So I'd say 2011 is when it really got heightened for most doctors in the state. Then as a matter of policy, it's, it's just been um, hearing stories of people going through it. Um, you know, for me, serving in this capacity, I, I've, I've heard a lot of testimony in front of our committee about problems with drugs. And, and now, um, again, serving as the Isaiah House director, I mean, I kind of got out of my comfort zone to do that. And um, I do Casey's Law evaluations for free for a lot of folks who can't find doctors to fill those out. So I hear a lot of, a lot of stories and um, the impact of people uh, of all walks of life, you know, rich, poor, black, white, church, non-church, uh, anything, any, any demographic you can imagine, it crosses all those barriers. And so it hits people from all over, people that are friends of ours, uh, close to us. And so, um, you know, you, you start realizing that, that it hits people that never had an intention of going that route, but are suddenly find themselves in those situations. So he knows and works with Janelle Brewer from Spark Ministries. And we have an episode with Janelle where we dive more into what Casey's Law is and how that works. Um, she knew I was in health and welfare and I was vice chair, now I'm the chairman. So she's reached out just for help in terms of trying to find funding and try to expand, you know, uh, kind of the knowledge about Casey's Law evaluation. So she's a fireball. Uh, and, and Janelle has a very personal story, obviously, in, in just knowing her story of trying to help her daughter and going into some rough parts of Winchester uh, to try to find her daughter and got the attention of people that were some rough people to rescue her and get her out of that. Um, and I think she's got a real heart for it. And so now th what they've done is they've reached out saying, we can't find doctors who want to fill out the paperwork. And I know it's a, it's a hassle to fill out paperwork. But I said, look, I'll do it for free if you can't find anybody. And so now I've become a person. I just, you know, yesterday was Sunday. And I spent um, in a couple hours going three cases that they couldn't find somebody to do. So and one of them, it turns out I knew from a, as a former patient of mine in my office. Um, so, you know, I, I get to go through their story and kind of fill out the paperwork, get all that ready and just do that on a volunteer basis. Um, but Janelle, you know, has been great. And I've, I've just I've run into her just through that effort, really through going through to public awareness meetings to let people know what Casey's Law are, how you can help your loved ones to help them get help. Um, trying to advocate for the things she's trying to get done. Um, so I've run into her in a lot of those capacities, both in a legislative role and then just as a, a doctor patient role, too. So um, yeah. she's been great. Good, yeah. good. So then the second introduction question I had from earlier was, um, how did you end up getting more involved in the legislature? Like what convinced you that you needed to go in and start doing something about the changing policies? Was, was that what the drive was at all? Yeah, so you know, we practice defensive medicine in Kentucky because of that. The cost of healthcare goes way, way up. 
the AMA just put out a report, malpractice insurance for providers, hospitals, nursing homes, doctors, going up 30%, the most of any other uh, state in the union. So we're, we have the highest liability costs, um, no limitations on how lawyers do things here, a bar that doesn't control how lawyers do things here. So I could go on for an hour talking about that, but that's what motivated me. I told my wife I needed to get more involved. Uh, someone knocked on our front door while I was at the office and she was home with the kids. Uh, and he was Ernie Fletcher was running for governor, put a sign up, sure we're Republicans. Hey, by the way, my husband wants to get more involved. And that guy was a local party chairman who then reached out and said, how about running for office? And I was a fireball. I said, let's go, man. I'll, you know, I know what to do. I know how to fix things. And we ran for office in 04 uh, for state rep and uh, got beat that year narrowly. Um, but people thought, hey, your name ID's up, run again in 06. 06 was a horrible year for Republicans. George Bush's second term. People voted against Republicans. And I got crushed. And um, I got, you know, the Saturday after the election, I got the N-word spray painted on the front of my house. And my mother, who lives with us, uh, was scared. Uh, my wife said, hey, listen, we got kids at home, six and eight. We don't need this, you know. And But the, the conversation to talk to my kids about what does that word mean? Why is that on our house? That, that, that angered me to have to have a conversation with a six and an eight-year-old about that kind of stuff. But he stuck with it through all of this and eventually was elected to the Kentucky State Senate. Once I've gotten in this role um, as a chairman, you, substance use you know, issues are kind of you know, the forefront of the fight medically right now, what's going on in our state. It's costing a lot of lives. We're, we're seeing a lot of that issue, so you can't ignore that. And I think more and more doctors are transforming their practices from primary care into helping people with addiction recovery. Uh, and again, I just was one of those people, I was asked a long time ago to get involved. No thanks, I don't wanna police a lot of folks. It's a hassle, it's a headache. I don't wanna do it, I wanna put my license in jeopardy. And now I find myself kind of in, in the middle of that front now. So it's kind of unique how that happens. You just adapt to the needs of your population and the people around you. And it's a much bigger problem, um, a, b a much bigger problem, I think, than a lot of us realized years ago. And it's just gotten bigger. So, And the hard part is just getting rid of the stigmas that is associated with a lot of the disease state and, and you know, treating people with the dignity they deserve and knowing that most of them want to get out of that cycle. Um, so that that's where I find some some solace and some, some satisfaction really is that there's a lot of people that once you talk to them, they know they got to do something to change the direction. Otherwise, they're going to wind up dead. So the reason why Senator Alvarado is such an intriguing guest on our show is because he knows how the medical profession works. And now his role in the government as a legislator is to help direct policy. And I think it's pretty easy for us to forget how big of a role policy actually plays in our lives. You can think of a basketball game and how much the rules in the game changes when you introduce the three-pointer or a limited number of fouls that you can get in a game. So it's important to have a senator who is an advocate for recovery to set the rules up to let recovery happen. But it's still no easy task because healthcare in America is so complicated. So the hard part with healthcare, especially with red tape in healthcare, um, a lot of it's influenced by insurance companies. Once you include them in Medicaid in particular, and you have managed care organizations, uh, the red tape comes from that. A lot of the bills we pass are to put laws on the insurance companies who we contract with. So we're not going to go into the details of why insurance is complicated. Just understand that health insurance in this country is crazy. It's ridiculous. It's criticized. But it's also very important for how things work. You know, it's it's regulated because you cannot deny treatment to anybody. Now, ethically, we don't do that. But by law, if someone shows up to an ER and doesn't, you know, you don't, you can't say, do you have insurance? Can you pay me? No, you take care of their problem. You address their needs and you're liable if you don't. Uh, that in and of itself makes it a non-free market system. In other countries, uh, you can go into a third world country, go to an ER and say, I'm dying, help me. And they go, do you have money? Do you have insurance? No then have a seat. I got a paying customer who might have a minor problem, but they're paying me. I'm going to treat them first. And if I have time and I feel like it, I'll help you. That is unconscionable for an American to go through, right? As Americans, un unconscionable, we don't do that. As a doctor, it's unconscionable for me not to offer help to someone who needs it. That's just the way we are. That's what Americans are. That's the way we think. Um, and so because of that, we've created systems around it to protect patients and to ensure those things. The goal of insurance is to make sure that people are getting taken care of, to make sure that our people are as healthy as possible and that we're able to pay doctors to be able to take care of people. That's all how it's designed to work. That In a perfect world, that's how it works. But we're not in a perfect world, so that's not how things work exactly. 
but people are trying to figure it out. There are people working very hard to make things better for us, to open up as many doors for treatment as we can. So most doctors and most medical professionals will do more work if they know it'll lead to better quality outcomes for patients. So a lot of that red tape, it's such a complicated web of healthcare. Um, a lot of intersecting points, you touch one part of it, the whole web shakes, everybody freaks out. So you have to be very careful to know where the pressure points are, and, um, but a lot of red tape in healthcare. So as that relates back to, uh, especially physicians who are doing what they can to address addiction, like uh, people who are either just involved with stuff like Casey's Law, like you said, or uh, people who are internal specialists who are doing like some of the Suboxone clinics, uh, some of those prescribers. Does that, does it get more in involved for those people at all, like that are more involved in that? We've made it easier. Um, we've made it easier in terms of opening up more beds, making it easier for a lot of our providers that provide inpatient services for patients, and we've provided more funding, made it easier for that, uh, even for prior authorizations for MAT. And those MATs that he's talking about are medically assisted treatments, and it's basically when doctors prescribe specific medicines that help people manage their addiction. So what he's saying here is that basically doctors are allowed to prescribe this medicine to help people with addiction easier than before. What would happen, a person would come to see us on a Friday saying, I just I almost overdosed, I overdosed last night or almost did, I gotta stop, I'm gonna kill myself, I need help right now. And when that moment happens, you gotta strike when the iron is hot. Um, and what would happen is, well, I wanna put you on this, but I gotta get permission from your insurance company. So I have to wait till Monday to get you your medicine, and that weekend they would overdose at home and die, and you'd lose people that way. So we said, get rid of that barrier, write what you gotta do, let them be doctors, and, and cover them during that, in that period of time. Um, so that law was just passed. So removing barriers like prior authorization for MAT, letting more doctors prescribe that. Um, you know, we're trying to make it, we're asking the cabinet to explore, even to use your cell phones for, um, you know, we have no, not as many counselors. We know that counseling plus medicines both is what works to get people off of these things. They're starting to use digital therapeutics, they call it. We have computer programs on your cell phone that you could fill out. Half of that, half live, and to makes makes it easier. Telehealth, we've really loosened up. So you're able to do a lot of this stuff now um, through Zoom calls and from people from home. So if they don't want to come in, we make it as easy as we can in that regard. So a lot of things we've been doing to loosen it up. Yeah. There's regs that we need to have and rules to keep people in check, but... But it's moving in a good direction. It, yeah, I think yeah. It, it, we made it a lot easier. We continue to try to make it as easy as we can. So a couple things come to mind here for me. First is my introduction to the opiate crisis that we have. And as Senator Alvarado already talked about earlier in this interview, you look back at how we got into this resurgence in the first place, and a lot of it was we trusted doctors, and doctors prescribed these opiate-based medicines that proved to be highly addictive in the long run and caused a lot of problems. So there's this deep-seated distrust of doctors as a result of this. And I can't help but think about that when I'm talking to doctors about addiction treatments. But then if you recall our episode with Scott Seitz from a while back, where he said that that's just one of the parts of the medical world is you're constantly learning. You're always updating your information. You're always trying to find the best practices. So once it became apparent that the opiates were actually causing quite a bit of harm, they changed course. And to this point, we see how big of a crisis we have with these drugs. And the doctors are really going in the opposite direction now. They're taking trauma patients. So somebody comes in with a massive car wreck, multiple fractures, horrible pain. They're treating them with ibuprofen and, and Tylenol and no narcotics before and after surgery. So you're laying up, you know, you know, major body casts in, in pain and the Tylenol and ibuprofen works. So they're not giving them automatic narcotics, which is what we used to do. We're starting to see now, you know, a lot of surgeons are, um, we passed some laws also to say th only three days of acute pain narcotics. If you go to an ER and you fracture a leg, they can give you three days worth, but anything beyond that, they gotta do a bunch of information. So the doctors don't wanna do that. So here's three days and that's all you'll get. Follow up with your doctor. So there's a lot of education amongst ourselves, um, a lot more consciousness. The state's down about 10 to 15 percent in its overall opiates in the last 10 years. Um, and so in certain counties, it may be higher, but um, we've seen a, a reduction. So I think there's a less likelihood of being able to get medicines from your doctor. I mean, a lot less people prescribing it. So I think it's had the desired effect. We're, we're seeing benefits, but doctors are educating each other on the topic all the time. And it's being taught in med school and residency now, too.
So it is very promising to be looking at the medical field now because they're on board with stuff. They're helping in this fight against addiction now. So we're going to change directions a little bit now, though, and start looking at Senator Alvarado's involvement with Isaiah House. Let's get into Isaiah House. Yes. What, yeah, what's up with Isaiah House? So Isaiah House, uh, great organization, great reputation. Uh, you know, they're a group, Mark LaPalm, you know, is a founder, and a lot of people know his story, and he's been in recovery for 20, I don't know, 22, 25 years, something like that. He's always very front and center about that, and because he's gone through it, he puts himself in every patient's role that goes through the, the clinic. Uh, everything uh, I can tell just from the emails he sends out, the meetings have been involved with him. He's concerned about what's that person's experience going to be when we go through this. We want to have a certain experience. We want dignity for these folks. Uh, you know, it, everything is faith based. So for him, it's about introducing Christ in their lives and making sure that they have a, a new focus um, coming out. And, and the success rates are remarkable for Isaiah House. I mean, it's the people that come out of that are tremendous. Um, he hires people that go through his program to come back to be peer support specialists for people going, you know, through clinic. Um, and there was a time, I think, where he thought, I, I don't want to replace this with another drug, you know, which is his philosophy, which I agree with also. I mean, as a doctor, I don't like to replace one with another. You want to have, be able to break people from that cycle and getting them another focus. But there are people out there who probably do need MAT. And he's come around to that point, I think, where there's, you know, it doesn't fit for everybody. They try to minimize how many pills you're taking. And so, um, you know, he had approached me, the previous director he had just, just passed away. Uh, and in August, he was, uh, he kind of stepped down from his role and he needed a new medical director. And they were opening up a primary care clinic because a lot of these folks, when they go through substance use recovery, they, they don't have doctors who are willing to see them. And so they've opened up a medical clinic on the side, which is independent, uh, that can see adults and kids, you know, and see all kinds of primary care issues. But um, also for folks that once they go through Isaiah House, through the inpatient recovery, they go out through intensive outpatient treatment, uh, or they get back and they just need a clinic to go to, they can get, you know, MAT treatment and counseling at, at our, you know, one clinic, get primary care in the one next door. Uh, and he's been setting up this model in other parts of the state. So I think Woodford County has one. The one I go to is in Danville. Um, and then Willisburg is still the main hub of where he's got the main facility. But the federal government comes in, asks, how do you guys do this? It's such a great, you know, your rates are tremendous here. Can we duplicate this throughout the rest of the country? And so I think he works really hard at helping others who want to start up recovery centers of their own and helping them get that. Because I think for him, it's not so much about having control of that. I think he just wants to be able to have uh, a ministry that goes beyond just his borders that help others get the same thing started and to, to save people from, from addiction, really. So it's been, um, I don't think I've met one person who says that Isaiah House was a bad experience. Everybody I've ever talked to who has gone through it says, yeah, they were great. Families think it's great. Um, so I, again, when he asked me, I was uncomfortable. I thought I'm not, again, I've, I've avoided this for a long time. And I thought, I don't know if I want to do this. Um, but he said, yeah, we want to run our own lab. We need someone who's going to make sure we're following the regulations. And so uh, I kind of got into that role and, and tweaked a few things to make sure everything is real tight. So we're doing things by the rules. Um, the way we're prescribing things are by the rules, keep people accountable. Uh, it's been a really good experience and, and I'm proud to work with them. They've, they've got a great reputation up here in Frankfurt. I know that for sure. Good. Yeah. Good. That's a that's a good thing. So I'm curious then when the Fed comes down and asks how do you guys do this? What is what is the secret ingredient? Do you think it's you know, it's things that probably the federal government doesn't feel comfortable with. I mean, I, I think the faith-based component is huge. Um and I, I'm a Christian, that's a core part of my belief system in my life and um you know, if you don't have God as a guiding light for you and everything that you do, um, I, I don't know that people can achieve, achieve their fullest potential for things because everybody views things as just, there's people out there who just believe this is our only lifespan and nothing goes beyond it. I think we're eternal beings and things happen even after death. Um, and so to prepare for that, I think, is as important as anything. And um, people who are introduced to Christ and introduced um, uh, to following God and what he teaches and what he cares for you, people regain self-worth. They know what their value is. They know that they, their experience can help others instead of feeling like I'm lost, I'm unworthy of anything. And I think a lot of people who go through, they seek relief through substances or find themselves hooked or addicted, have underlying issues that decreases their self-worth. Uh, they don't think they're valuable to anybody. And we're all valuable to, to Christ and to God who cares about all of us. And so I think once that gets reintroduced in their lives, or if they've never been introduced, they learn about that. Um, they realize their value and that they can help others. And it's just a... It's a transformation that you see in Christians who truly give their lives over to God, and, and it's fun to see that. I think a lot of people, um, you know, and, and again, it, it keeps you uh, humble to appreciate that, that the, these are the folks you see after they go through recovery, if you don't know their past, you wouldn't know that these people had any issues or problems. 
And again, you just try to destigmatize um, what they go through. And I think the business communities come around. Um, they're, they're, we're trying to create as many second chances as we can for folks. They go through these programs to get them the education they need, get them back out, get them housing, get them away from their old environments, get them work. Uh, and again, a lot of them find a lot of satisfaction and, and you save a lot of lives that way. So it's, um, but the feds hear that, they can't introduce a lot of that, but they see the model and they try to copy the model of inpatient, the support that's provided and then letting those folks come out and help others. Because I, I can have somebody come into my office and you know, I can tell them, hey, you shouldn't do A, B and C. And they'll look at me and say, you don't know what I've been through. You know, you don't, you, and I haven't, thank goodness, thank God. But there are people that do and have seen it and have a pretty good BS meter to know when someone's not telling them the truth and when they're trying to tell them something wrong. And they can sniff that out and call them out on it and say, I've been where you've been. I know what you're going through. And they know that they know. And that makes all the difference to connect with people to help you get through rough times. So yeah. it's, uh, you know, addictions have been with mankind since the beginning of time. Um, it's just, you know, we're we made it easier for people to get hooked these days. And so we're trying to find ways to reverse that and, and treat it like a medical condition instead of a, a social stigmatization is what it comes down to. Yeah. So that is an incredible closing bit. Sure. Um, I've got one more question for yeah, you. Yeah, far away. Where do you see your personal role in the whole in the whole approach? You know, um, so now I'm, I'm medically involved as a doctor, and I tell people that the political stuff is only for a short period of, of of your life, right? The political titles and the accolades that some people find um, is for a short period. I'm a doctor for life. And so for me, you know, doing the medical side of it is where I find satisfaction. I find a lot of fun uh, helping people out. I got into it for that reason. The political stuff just kind of happened along the way. I didn't expect a lot of this. I mean, when I came to Kentucky, I didn't thought, hey, I'm going to run for the state legislature. I mean, that didn't cross my mind. Um, I'm in a different role now, and I'm, I'm pretty vocal. I talk a lot. Uh, I'm the kind of guy who, um, you know, and I'm, I'm pretty open about how things are run here. And I think a lot of our providers find some hope and, okay, there's someone who understands our world there. So I have an opportunity to educate a lot of providers that are going through things, kind of craft things to make it easier for them to do their jobs. Um, so in this role, I just try to make it as easy to protect patient-physician relationships. That's really, for me, it's getting back to that, getting government, as much government out of the way, insurance companies out of the way. I know they have their jobs and their roles to do. They can do it in a different way than getting in the, in the office with the patient and the doctor. So for me, it's making that as easy as possible, um, reducing barriers. Um, and, and really, you know, I, again, I, I can, if I'm going to talk the talk, you need to walk the walk. I'm engaging it now too. So trying to encourage providers to help where they can, even if it's in a limited capacity or know where they can refer people to get that help. So for me, it's, it's going to continue to see, you know, I don't know where things will go long term. Uh, politically, I have no idea. I go, you know, I'm only elected for a four-year term. So if my constituents say, out you go, then again, I'm a doctor and I stay in that role. I don't take my, my time here for granted. Well, that's all the time that we have today. Thank you guys for tuning in and listening. We need to be mindful about the policymakers that we elect and put in office. We need to be sure that they're standing for the same values that we have, that there are also advocates for recovery, making things easier for people to get help, not putting up more barriers. But thank you, Senator Alvarado, for taking the time to come be on our show. We really appreciate it. You have a lot of great insight into this whole field. And uh, yeah, we've learned a lot from you. Thank you so much. Also, I would like to thank WSKV for broadcasting our show and all the help they've put in along the way. Also, a big thank you to the Powell County Health Department and Kentucky Rio, who are responsible for the show existing. If it wasn't for those two groups, we would not be here listening to these stories from people and learning what we are from all these experts. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. I'm your host, Nate Brooks. You've been listening to The Local Lens. These are our people using our voices, telling our stories, because no one sees it like we do.